everyone. Welcome to the Trial Site News podcast interview series. I'm Dr. Aaron, your host. Thanks for joining in. Today, my guest is Dr. Nico Andre. He is from AstraZeneca that they just did a clinical trial, published data on a drug for different types of leukemia and lymphoma, but I will let him explain that. It's called Calquince, but thank you so much for joining us, Nico. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Yeah. So first, can you tell us a little bit about you, your background, and what you do at AstraZeneca? Yeah, so my background is I'm a medical oncologist, hematologist by training, never really joined uh, or planned to join industry, but then was really fascinated about the science progress that industry was moving forward with in particular in the last 15 years. Um, I'm with AstraZeneca now on accountable for the global hematology franchise and the immuno-oncology franchise, so all medicines that we're deploying for hematologic diseases and that we're moving forward in the immuno-oncology space, which has seen significant growth also with regards to our scientific knowledge, but also with regards to the medicines delivered for patients in the last couple of years. So it's a very exciting time uh, uh, to be part of this. Absolutely. And I've, I've been reading a lot about the immunotherapy too. I'm just personally interested in that. It's very fascinating. So tell us a little bit about this phase three trial and the drug Calquence. And what, what is the mechanism of action of this drug? So Calquence is what we call a next generation Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It sounds very complicated. In fact, what Calquence does, it's an oral medicine that you take two times a day. And it's a medicine that inhibits an enzyme, which is very active in particular in B lymphocytes and helps B lymphocytes to rapidly grow and multiply meaning that it's a formidable target in those cancer diseases where B cells are growing out of order and are creating cancerous growth because it allows the suppression of B cell growth and multiplication of malignant B cells. It's a very established treatment concept with a first generation BTK inhibition already being in clinic for several years but these first medicines have also come with a certain side effect profile and hence science is always interested in advancing how these medicines actually have an impact on the disease, but also how they're improving on the tolerability profile. And Calquence as next generation Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor is now available since December, 2019 in the US for treating first line and later lines, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and also mental cell lymphoma, which are um, very well characterized diseases in the lymphoma space and where modern treatments with low side effect profiles are actually quite warranted because the treatment duration for these diseases is very, very long. Um, so the trial was Elevate RR, is that, was that the name of the f phase three trial? Okay. Yeah. So Elevate RR is actually an, a really interesting trial. It's not the pivotal trial that gave us the label for our major indication, which is frontline treatment of CLL patients. It's, however, an extremely important trial and also from its setup, uh, uh, quite a great example for good science because it is something that you will see only very infrequently in clinical trials. It is a direct head-to-head -head trial comparing the new medicine versus the established medicine in the same class. And that's actually the boldest, most transparent scientific experiment you can do. And this trial was set up specifically to look if we would see less side effects and a better tolerability profile while maintaining the very good effect on the cancer growth itself. So it's a head-to-head -head trial on what we call non-inferiority on the efficacy and potential superiority, a better safety profile in those side effects that were previously known as being associated with the class of this medicine. Okay, that makes sense. That, that cleared that, that up for me as well. So I appreciated that. So tell me about this trial, since we're called Trial Site. Where was it done? How many people were in it? 
So the trial started in 2015, which also gives you a flavor how long these trials take and how, what a substantial investment they are. And I think that trial site obviously is, is uh, carrying quite some expertise in that, so that might be of interest. It's a trial that enrolled 533 patients in the control arm and in the study arm. It was conducted in 132 clinical trial sites in 15 countries around the world, with the majority of the countries being either US or key European markets to ensure that we're also really looking at comparable clinical care standards, which are obviously very important when it comes to how we're evaluating the management of side effects and the safety profiles. All right, so lots of places uh, to, to get results from here. So you mentioned that you were basically testing the safety of this drug against the established drug. Um, so what, did, what results did you find and did it maintain the effect of the drug that you were hoping it would? Yeah. So first of all, the effect of the drug that's also been demonstrated in the direct control trials that have led to the respective labels in CLL and in mantle cell lymphoma was fully confirmed. And we have now today a much broader set of multi-year data very strongly confirming the truly excellent clinical efficacy of the drug in treating CLL and MCL. Yet for the Elevate RR trial in particular, we've seen a tolerability profile, which for the patients in the totality of the data was favorable and was specifically also better in side effects that are often attributed as being class effects of BTKI inhibition. So we saw specifically improvements in the number of events of cardiac side effects and specific uh, 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 atrial fibrillation. We saw less hypertension and we saw less side effects that are also commonly associated, for example, as bleedings or uh, uh, diarrhea. So we've done, and that's the specific of the latest publication at ASH this year, we've done additional analysis beyond the first publication to put the side effects into a time horizon perspective. So we're not just looking at the side effects and the number in which they're happening, we're looking at how frequent are they? How are they building up over the time to have a much more realistic picture for what the individual patient is actually experiencing? And in these additional analyses, which have just been published at this year's ASH, in the uh, last year's ASH in December, um, we've seen that the tolerability profile is actually quite favorable for Kalkmans. So in essence, it gives you the same efficacy, but it comes with a better tolerability profile. For me, as a hematologist, oncologist, what is always very important is talking to colleagues and ask clinical experience and the day-to-day -day life what their patients is. And the feedback that we're hearing from the colleagues in the field of hematologists is that they see an extremely well manageable tolerability profile. They see much less bleeding. They see hardly any cardiac events. And with bleeding, I mean bruising. So it's more like getting bruises when you bump against something rather than really have, having nosebleeds. One side effect that is still very common for calquins is headaches, but these headaches are very well controllable because they're not like super terrible. So you can easily treat them with standard headache medication. And hence, we're actually looking at a medicine that is now seeing very rapid uptake in clinical standard use simply because physicians, once they're using it, see that it's really so well tolerated while they certainly can trust on the full efficacy of the medicine as BTK inhibitor. Interesting. And just to clarify for some folks, when you said ASH, you're talking about the American Society of Hematology. Is that right? Yeah, ASH is the American Society of Hematology. They have a meeting once a year, which is their global meeting. It was actually, interestingly, one of the first times that we had an in-person virtual hybrid meeting again. I actually went to Atlanta where it took stage. And it was wonderful to reconnect with the colleagues, with the research community, obviously much less people there. But uh, I'm, I'm excited about getting back to normal because the direct interaction and scientific exchange obviously makes a huge difference. I, I think we're all excited about getting back to normal. Um, may, maybe 2022 will be the year for that. Um, 
I wanted to ask you, and I know you did a great job of talking about the different um, safety concerns and how Calquins uh, did better there against the standard drug, the controlled drug, so to speak. Uh, is is at atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter? That's a that can be a significant issue. And was that is that like a high on the? I, I just wanted to dive into that a little bit more. Yeah. So atrial fibrillation, and I've been treating many patients with atrial fibrillation myself while I was uh, active in clinic in internal medicine. It's actually quite frequent in the elderly population. So at times it's even hard to say. Is it from the medicine or is it just an impact of age? And we also have additional data of that through meta-analysis from uh, all of our trials uh, recently published by Dr. Brown, which give us additional confidence in that space. Atrial fibrillation is something that in the long term, because your heart is, is, is just moving so irregularly, it can cause coagulation inside the heart. And these coagulated blood clots can actually uh, uh, move into the brain circulation and cause strokes or other what we call emboli, so that there's a uh, an emboli stuck in the bloodstream. And that's obviously uh, what has to be avoided. So if you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, you need constant monitoring of your heart rhythm. It can be treated uh, uh, with uh, drugs that try to bring you back to the normal rhythm or that at least try to keep you at a normal frequency. It can be treated with uh, um, catheter ablation. So you put a catheter into the heart through the uh, uh, femoral uh, artery, and then you're basically using electricity or cryotherapy to kill the cells that are using this or that are, that are delivering this abnormal rhythm. But it's, it's a condition that just requires constant attention. Yeah, many people live with it and die with it at a normal age, but it's something that once you have it, you can hardly get rid of it. So the main interest is to avoid the onset. And that's where we really see the, the, the substantial strength um, of Calquins. Thank you. That was a great explanation. Uh, I learned something in there too. Lots of things in there. Um, you know, for maybe more of a lay population, I know you talk to a lot of scientists and doctors, but maybe people who are watching this, uh, what sort of patient population would this would this drug be suited for? And, and is, you know, does it matter what stage of cancer that they're in or a loved one might be in? Yeah, so the general answer is for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, basically every patient can be put on calquins at onset of diagnosis and once a physician decides to initiate the treatment because we have data clearly showing that we have excellent efficacy in all what we call subtypes of patient populations. There's differences in the gen genetic makeup of the disease. There's differences in the fitness stadium of patients, how fit they are, whether they have comorbidities, if they're on co-medications. So all of these aspects, when you look at them, Calquins actually is an extremely safe and very effective drug. So there's really no limitations. And we have also shown at this ASH that we're improving what we call the formulation, the way that the medicine is produced right now, it's capsules. From next year onward, we will move from capsules to tablets that are even better tolerated, even for example, if you have a gastric ulcer and you need to take medication for that, it's not interfering at all. So the, 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 the usage for CLL is really broad. In MCL, we have a label for what we call relapsed refractory. That's for patients that have received chemo or chemo immunotherapy as an initial treatment and then see return of their disease. But we're uh, uh, in a large scale clinical trial as we talk right now, which is called the ECHO trial, where we're also looking at bringing calquins to patients right from the very beginning of the diagnosis of mental cell lymphoma. And we're very confident to see these data moving forward in the years ahead. Fascinating. And you, you talked about, a little, about it a little bit before when you said, you know, patients were telling you that they were tolerating this drug, which I think is kind of the best sort of feedback you can get. Are there any other concerns uh, that the clinical trial highlighted in terms of adverse effects or you know safety issues related to this drug? 
I think what's really important for us when we put the patient at the center of uh, uh, our considerations, and that's always key if you want to deliver meaningful medicines, because by the end of the day, they really need to make sense for the patients taking them, is to really put yourself into the typical situation of a patient with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is usually these are elderly patients, so they obviously don't want a treatment that makes them even more sick. And they don't want a treatment that inhibits their daily routine. And they want a treatment that they can have confidence and take in over years because the treatment goal in CLL, which, and that may be a, a, an important information here, is still considered to be incurable, is to suppress and to keep the cancer at bay as long as possible. And our medicines today, and Kalkman's in the first row here, deliver on that. They basically suppress the cancer for many, many, many years. But that means you have to be on the drug for many, many years. And you certainly then put even more emphasis on being on a drug that's very well tolerated and that does not impact your daily life. And that's the feedback that we're getting from patients and their treating physicians and the community. And that certainly is a very strong testimony uh, uh, to the meaningfulness of this medicine. Absolutely. So if a patient, a doctor wants to learn more about this drug, is there a website that they can go to to get more information? Yeah, so I'm, I'm from time to time, I'm always curious to see how the medical education and medical information actually is, is, is uh, finding its way through internet. So I'm just typing in either the drug name of a, of a drug or the, the generic name and see what pops up. Um, I, I also did this for Calquins and the, the scientific name is Acalabrutinib. Um, the information that's popping up usually is pretty good and straightforward. I would still recommend because it's very controlled for quality, balance and accuracy to stick to company websites for these purposes. So you can just go in this particular case to calquens.com because it has all the uh, uh, really labeled and controlled information that you want to know. And it's even split into a healthcare provider and a patient and a community information page. So it's really well done if you seek more information. And it also gives you all the support contacts that you may need as a patient or as a healthcare professional to uh, uh, get into more detailed questions in case there's any specific questions that you may have. Perfect. Calquence.com. And we'll include that in the podcast description. It's easy enough to remember, but we'll still write it down. Um, company website, which and I appreciate your point. There's so many sources of information out there today. So you uh, just go to the company's website if you're interested. Um, thank you so much, Nico, for your time uh, explaining Calquence to us and the results of the clinical trial. Um, definitely come back on or let us know if the, there's new results, new trials in the works. That's what we're interested in. And thank you to all our viewers for joining in and hope you guys learned something too.